Get ready. You're listening to Give God 90 live. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Give God Give God Ninety as we listen to the fire trucks go by. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, that kind of caught me off guard just a little bit there, but I shouldn't have been because it happens all the time here. Um, where was it? Oh, welcome to Give God Ninety. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> my name's Jerry Mitchell, my lovely wife Myra, your host for Give God Ninety. We thank you so much for joining us live today on a Thursday. And something uh, interesting to talk about tonight, and that is how what's going to happen with the United Methodist Church may affect you, even though you might not be a United Methodist. So you might not even be going to a church. You might not even uh, you might even be an atheist. I can say, say that, and it will have it has a potential to have an effect on you for various reasons. But we'll get into that in a moment. A um, couple things I want to remind you of. We are live on Facebook. We are also live on Spreaker and many other podcast platforms. The chat is open on Spreaker if you're joining us that way. Uh, you can join in. <clears throat> also, something I have probably not been very good at because somebody asked me about this. Um, the folks on Facebook don't know the folks on Spreaker. And the folks on Spreaker don't always know the folks on Facebook. Hi, Pam. And so sometimes Hi, we we talk to folks on Facebook. Sometimes we talk to people on Spreaker. And sometimes it, it's a little bit confusing out there. So I'm going to have to get better at remembering to read the questions from one to the other so everybody knows what's going on. Does that make sense? Oh, I just thought you didn't do that on purpose. I would have No, I, I just... <laughs> um, Okay. They're, they're, they're two different programs. There's no way to merge the two. So, no. so you can't see what's happening one way or the other. Mm-mm. But sometimes it gets a little confusing for folks. So I'll try, try to remember to put those two things together. All right? Um, as, best I, as best I can explain them. Anyway, uh, we are in the middle of, or getting ready to be in the middle of all kinds of holidays. So... What better, you know, a lot of people give gifts for these holidays, whether it's Christmas, Hanukkah, or whatever it happens to be. Don't forget, if you're giving gifts, give something worthwhile. Um, one of my books works really well from my yeah, perspective. Does. You know, Available <laughs> at Amazon or Barnes & Noble's uh, Tradition to Truth, One Man's Search for Honest Answers, and God's Universe, God's Rules, which is being reviewed currently by... Um, one of the addiction counseling groups. So good things are going on there. Hopefully they will say, yes, we like it and buy lots of them. So, (laughs) (laughs) but, um, I've got a lot of ground to cover tonight with what's going on with the Methodist church and how it could affect you. Whether you're a Methodist, whether you're, um, uh, go to a different church even if you're an atheist, it still has the potential to affect you. And the reason that the, the United Methodist Church is getting ready to divide is their story to tell. I don't really need to go into why that's happening, but it is happening. Um, I think they have accepted the fact that it's going to happen. The American contingent. Remember the United Methodist Church is a worldwide organization. Um, I grew up in a Methodist Church. If you read Tradition to Truth, I tell you a little bit about that and how some of the things work there. Um, we were married in a Methodist Church. 
sang in the choir, served on committees, did all kinds of things until we realized this isn't working. <laughs> and we left, not because of the people in the church, but because of the United Methodist Church in general. Right. You know, the, the people in the churches are typically very nice folks. They're friendly, they're mm-hmm. outgoing, they're, they're really nice people. But the way the organization run, or is run, I should say, that's where things get a little weird. Mm -hmm. That's a pleasant way to put it. So we left the Methodist Church, and and the American part of the Methodist Church uh, has decided they don't like the way the, the worldwide Methodist Church operates anymore. And so... For a few years now, this has been going on. They've been arguing over this. Now, uh, it looks like in, I think it's in April when the next general conference is, there's four plans being proposed that give them the opportunity to separate and go their their separate ways. Um, Much like a divorce, much like Brexit in the European Union. (laughs) You know, it it takes time to do that. So that's going on. The thing is, the Methodist Church is worldwide. It's huge. Now, if everybody remembers, in 2008, we had the uh, banking crisis, right? And everybody said, oh, these banks are too big to fail. We've got to prop them up. And so there was a lot of things going on. Mm -hmm. The Methodist Church, being a worldwide organization with over 80 million members, is the second wealthiest Protestant denomination in the world. The first, being Catholics, not Protestant, but it's it's the, the wealthiest. The second wealthiest is the Methodist. There is another couple of denominations with a few more members, but the way they the way they are organized, they don't have the, well, to put it bluntly, they're just not as rich as the Methodist Church is. The way the Methodist Church is structured, um, the the congregation doesn't own the land or the building. It mm-hmm. belongs to the Methodist Conference, the Worldwide mm-hmm. Methodist Church. So, if you give, <clears throat> let's let's say you give money or you give something, maybe an item, to your local Methodist Church, it's not theirs. Mm-mm. It belongs to the worldwide organization, and so when this when this separation occurs, you're going to have what I think will be a large block of uh, how to, how's a good way to explain it? the the church that remains, and you're going to have a smaller section that that kind of splinters off, and of the four. Uh, Plans that they have set forth right now, you know, they they name them the in uh, I think Indianapolis, Philadelphia, and there's a couple others. And yes, I have read through them. If you're wondering, and none of them, um, none of them are really good, but they're better than what they have. <clears throat> there is a large way that the Worldwide Methodist Church gets to keep most of the funds. It's just the way it is. Um, one of the things that makes the Methodist Church so wealthy is they happen to own a particular building in New York City. And that particular building sits in a very prominent place, right next to the United Nations building. Most people don't, like, don't know that. <laughs> the people who know it don't really like it. But that's just life. That's, they own it. They're, they're a private organization. They own it. They can do whatever they want, right? Mm-hmm. Members of the Methodist Church don't always realize what's going on because most of the time the general members, they just sit in the pews and they go listen. They sing in a choir maybe. Maybe they serve on a committee or two. And that's usually all that happens. But the people who really get involved with the structure um, can't do common. Oh, Okay. <laughs> for the folks on Spreaker, Jay said he can't do comments. The chat is open. I'm not sure what's going on there. But Jay said he can't do comments on Spreaker. Um, so he'll be on Facebook, which is, that's okay. 
Hi, Jay. Hi, Tina. Hi, Carol. Uh, enjoy having you folks join us. Um, but the Methodist Church, being that wealthy and being that worldwide, really has, and especially having that many members, you know, over 80 million members, that's a lot of people. That has the potential to reach almost every nation in, in the world. Um, China kind of suppresses it a little bit, and that's okay. Africa is really, really um, founded in the United Methodist ministry. They, they have a lot of members in, in Africa. It's a large contingent, and it's a very conservative contingent. They're the ones basically responsible, well, between the Africans and the South Koreans, they are the two that are basically responsible for maintaining uh, the John Wesley doctrines for lack of a better word. So, with all of that wealth and with all of that influence and with all of that power, guess what happened? <laughs> Nations around the world have uh, set tax code, tax regulation, tax reform, and it's all tied to the way that the Methodist Church in some ways, does business. Mm -hmm. in, so, in other ways, it's tied to, well, in the United States, it's tied to the way the United States does business uh, in association with all the churches. And what I want to talk about tonight is mostly going to affect people in the United States because, well, that's what I'm most familiar with, and because the United States is the one that's kicking up the fuss, we're going to be, we're going to suffer the brunt of it. So... I'm just going to cut to the chase here and say this. If you give money to a nonprofit organization, that may change the way you do that may change in the future as a result of the split of the church. Mm -hmm. Because the United States has the federal government of the United States has wanted to change their nonprofit tax code for a few years. And this is the prime mm -hmm. time to do this. When everything's kind of in a turmoil and everything's upset, when everything's being rearranged with the churches, mm -hmm. the United States now has the opportunity to look at that and go, you know, now's a good time to do something about this. So if you give money for a, a tax deduction in the United States, the way that happens may alter. And that is not always going to be a bad thing. Here's why. There is a movement, again, to do away with certain government entities like the IRS. And they want to replace our current income tax code with some people want the flat tax, some people want the, the fair tax, some people want a value-added tax. There's a huge difference between those three. I lean towards the fair tax because that is the only one that is only on new goods and services, okay? Mm -hmm. So if you go buy something brand spanking new, you're going to pay tax on it, all right? Mm -hmm. If you go to a thrift store and and you know and buy a coat that somebody else has already worn, you don't pay any tax on it. So though there that's kind of insulated there. Um now it state and county taxes depending on the state and county you live in, may vary across the country. That's, that's going to still be there. But as a federal uh, tax, they would do away with the, the income tax. They would do away with your tax deductions. The only tax you would pay with a fair tax is on new purchases that you would make, or purchases of new items that you would make, is a better way to say that. So I kind of lean that way. Um, the value-added tax is kind of a bad idea. They did that in Great Britain. It's not working mm, yeah. <clears throat> because um, tax is added at every point of production. Mm. So it's not working. You know, if, if you're a carpenter and you go cut your own trees, okay, you pay a tax when you buy the tree. Mm -hmm. You pay a tax when you cut the tree because you've improved it. Mm -hmm. You pay a tax when you uh, make something out of the tree, and you pay a tax when you sell the tree the finished product. So at every point in production, there is a tax. tax. That's the value added tax. It's not a good thing. 
Mm-mm. Vote no to that one. <laughs> <laughs> Flat tax um, is is kind of odd too because it taxes everything new, used, and and whatever, but at different levels. You know, it, if you purchase an item that has a value of less than, let's say, pick a number, twenty dollars. You know, the tax on a twenty dollar item is going to be different than the tax on a fifty dollar item. It's going to be different than the tax on a hundred dollar item. It's going to be different than the tax on a thousand dollar item. It's graduated. But it actually graduates in a declining movement. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Okay. So the, the you know the fair tax really is, my opinion, the best way to go with that, because let's face it, if I go out and I buy a loaf of bread, I'm going to pay the same tax on that loaf of bread as somebody who makes ten million dollars. If they go out and buy that same loaf of bread, well, not the same loaf of bread, but yeah, one just like loaf. it, they pay the same tax. It's mm-hmm. it's equal. It's, there's, you know, it's just the way it is. It's equal. If I go out and buy a brand spanking new car, I'm going to pay the same tax on that car as somebody else is going to pay on one just like it. It's all equal. So, what happens, though, when we lose those deductions is people get to keep more money, right? Mm-hmm. They, they, and hopefully what's going to happen uh, Jay said they should take, they should take that five hundred three. You're right, uh, whatever it is, and depend on God and the and not the government. You're right, Jay. And that's what I'm getting to. So if you get to keep more money, what's going to happen? Hopefully, as Jay just points out, you're going to feel more charitable because you're going to give money where you want to give money. You're not going to give money to uh, a nonprofit for specifically for a tax deduction. A lot of people think if I give a tax deduction, that money's not taxed, but that's not correct. Mm-hmm. Um, if I make, and, and I'm going to pick numbers here just to be easy, if I make $1,000 a year and I give $100 away, that's 10%, right? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> now, let's pretend for a moment that out of that $1,000, okay, I give $100 away, I can now get taxed on $900. So if I get taxed on $900 at 10%, numbers to be easy, mm-hmm. okay? Now, that $100 I gave away doesn't get taxed at 9%. It gets taxed at like 7% because, trust me, the federal government is still going to get what they want. Not to get political, but they're going to get what they want. If you, go, if you do away with all of that and you just go to like a fair tax or flat tax... That goes away. Now you're free to give money where you want. The other problem is a lot of people like to give money to churches. Well, if you give money to the Methodist church, it doesn't stay unless you specify where it goes. Now, you can specify where that money goes and how it's spent. But if you don't do that, it goes into their general fund. If it goes into their general fund, they can use it to pay the electric bill. They can use it to do all all kinds of things. But, <laughs> but, but, there is a church tax that goes with that. It doesn't go to the government. It goes to, guess who? The United the Methodist Church. Church. The worldwide <laughs> United Methodist Church. Who has been caught giving money to people like the Palestinian Authority. For notorious reasons. There is a paper trail there. Not going into that tonight. I will get upset. So... <clears throat> It will, it does have, this This divide does have the tendency to affect you that way. Mm-hmm. It's sad, but it's true. It, it could have a tendency on how you donate money in the future. There is another way that this could affect people. The churches currently throughout the United States have what they call ordination processes. If you are ordained as a pastor or a minister, however they want to designate you, your credentials are through that denomination. Mm -hmm. Now, here's where things get hairy. Every state and every county should recognize or is required to recognize some type of ordination. So if um, in Delaware, if... If you are an ordained pastor, 
somebody has said you can you can do the job of pastor okay <clears throat> You go to the county clerk's office and walk up to the pathonotaries and you hand, you show them your credentials. They make a copy of it. Now, when somebody gets a marriage license, you can be the officiating person. Your signature goes on there. And in Delaware, two other people sign it. Part of that goes, one copy of that goes back to the county. You're legally married. But there's a separation of church and state in the United States, right? Mm-hmm. Supposedly. <laughs> Here's where I get a little upset with marriage oh. licenses. The only reason there are marriage licenses in existence in the United States today began around the 1850 mark. Okay? And what it was was a way to stop interracial marriage. It, it was racist. Let's put it that I'm going to be flat out blunt. It was racist. The states didn't want you to marry somebody outside of your race. Separate but equal, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. You know, yeah, That's you can. Make you me angry now. <laughs> you can get. You can get married. Just marry somebody of your own race. That didn't change in some states until 1967. Delaware was one of the first states to issue marriage licenses. And that means that the state had the right to tell you who you could and couldn't marry. Not the church. Now, marriage is a religious institution, right? Mm -hmm. It's supposed to be. It's supposed to be. But the problem is the state has now usurped the church's authority. But there's a separation of church and state. Actually, the First Amendment wasn't designed to keep the church out of the government. It was designed to keep the government out of the church. It didn't work there. It didn't work. (laughs) You know, Congress has a way of getting around anything, including the Constitution, apparently. Apparently. So, what we see today is we have this this piece of paper. (laughs) Jay says, government power is what it's all about. They're trying. They try very, very hard. Mm -hmm. But here's what we can do. Now's going to be a good time because all of these Methodist pastors who decide to change their denomination are going to have to receive new credentials. Now's a good time to say, you know what? Why don't we just do away with this thing called a marriage license? Now, here's where the insurance companies and the healthcare professionals are going to be jumping up and down going, you can't do that. Mm-hmm. Well, yes, we can. And it's very easy. Because the biggest reason today for a marriage license is to recognize who can and cannot make decisions for you. If you couldn't speak for yourself, I, you know, being married, they would come to me and say, what do you want us to do if, if something happened to you? We already have in place these things called insurance agents in this country. <laughs> They're fiduciary powers that go with that, which means they can handle financial responsibilities. They would have the authority, without a marriage license, if they're sitting down and they're writing an insurance policy, whether it's a life insurance policy, whether it's a health insurance policy, it doesn't matter, to say, okay, who's the beneficiary? You know, you get to, you get to pick. You know, a husband might not pick a wife. Right. A husband might pick somebody else. Might be a daughter or a son or a cousin. Who knows? And the other thing is, with health care... They could also ask the question, who would you like to be, who would you like to speak for you for health care if you can't speak for yourself? We already have these these systems in place today that goes through the lawyers, but an insurance agent can certainly very easily be able to do this as well. Because all they have to do is, is, you know, the person that I designate such and such, the person who is designated, they sign a paper, yes, I'm willing to do this, they seal it. It's done deal. And it's all done civilly. It covers all of the legal requirements. But all most, of the legal requirements. Most people nowadays don't even talk to an insurance agent. A lot of them don't. It's all by email. It's all done by it's all done online. And that's okay too, because guess what? As you're filling out those forms, they're legally binding forms. So whoever you name as beneficiary, whoever you would happen to name as a uh 
what are they called? The people that make decisions for you? I power, can't. power of attorney. Is it power? There's another word though. I can't remember the word. Anyway, what they what it would do is, is you designate well, that there's person. There's power of attorney of health. There's also. power of attorney of health also, but that's different. And um, so what we what we would do then is just fill those forms out. There would be one additional signature needed, and that is the person who is designated. You know, you just don't get to do it blindly anymore. So that would that would satisfy all of the legal requirements for that. We could do away with marriage licenses, put the power of marriage back into the church where it belongs. We could, you know, if you wanted to simply live together, you could live together. It's not a big deal. You could do all those things. I see Rebecca's joined us. Hi, Rebecca. Hi, Rebecca. Um, we could do all those things very easily, very simply, and because of the divide of the Methodist Church, now is the best time to start doing those things. We have this really unique opportunity in the United States. We can either sit back and do nothing and let the government decide what they want to do, or we can you know, go sit down and actually talk to your representatives and talk to your senators and talk to these people and say, now's a good time to get proactive about this. What, what do we need to do? How do we improve the system we're in? We can either sit back and let them decide, or we can be active and help them decide our way. <laughs> but the, but here's here's the other thing. If if we actually had the opportunity to do away with the IRS, do away with the income tax, we would. That means you do away with the marriage deduction, right? Mm-hmm. You get to keep all your money. You decide where it goes. Well, there's a concept. How about that? How about that? Now, here's the other thing. <laughs> somehow, Jay just said power to the people, and somehow I can see, you remember, um, oh, I was a kid, what was his name, Sammy Davis Jr.? I can see Jay. Power to the people, power to the people. <laughs> That's you, Jay. <laughs> you know, shaking his fist in the air. Power to the people. So, we can, we can do that. We have the power. We have the authority. We, we have, in the United States, the option to do those things. You know, people living in China or North Korea, they can't go sit down and talk to their representatives. Uh-uh. They can't say, you know what, let's do what's best for the people for a change. In the United States, we can do that. And believe it or not, as Christians, as Jews, we are required... We are required, we have been given the responsibility we have. to say, this is how we'd like to live. Because it's our job, it's our job, not to tell somebody else how to live, but to tell the people in authority over us how we would like to live. Mm-hmm. And when you get over this concept, um, you know, one of, the th- one of the biggest things that's wrong with that 501c3 um uh, non-profit thing for the churches is too many people believe that it it strips the church of any political authority mm. and it doesn't it puts it more in its control <clears throat> because what it is Mm-mm. since that has passed not one single church has ever not one single church has ever been confronted about this because they know it's unconstitutional they cannot stand up in court you cannot stop some. You can stop somebody from saying you sh- you should vote for this person or that person, but you cannot stop someone from saying, "Go talk to your representative." Mm-hmm. You cannot stop someone from saying, "You need to pursue this course of action." It can't be done. Oh, it was Flip Wilson. I'm sorry. It was Flip Wilson. Jay said mm-hmm. that was Geraldine too. I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to say a word about drag queen. <laughs> Flip Wilson would get dressed up like Geraldine. And, and, and um, I think he's one of the first ones I ever heard say, the devil made me do it. I bet Jay's laughing right now. <laughs> but, but seriously, we, we have a unique, author, a, a unique opportunity here to be involved in a process that will absolutely help us improve our own lives. 
Now, being involved somewhat in the political arena that we're involved in, I can tell you that it would be refreshing for some of these representatives and senators to hear from you because many of them have told me they know, depending on what situation mm -hmm. arises, who's going to call them, what time of day they're going to call. They know what they're going to say before they even say it because they get calls from the same people mm -hmm. time after time after time about the same issues time after time after time. Fresh voice mm -hmm. is always welcome. A lot of fresh voices is amazingly welcome. So don't be afraid to talk to these folks about mm -hmm. this. You know, if, if they don't know your feelings... They can't vote that they can't, way. They can't satisfy your needs. Mm -mm. And if the only time you're going to call them is when something's already happened, it's, it's too, too late. late. It's too late. Be proactive. Get ahead of this. Mm -hmm. as, a, as a nation and as a people, it doesn't... And this is something, it doesn't matter if you're Methodist. It doesn't matter if you're Catholic. It doesn't matter what color you are. It doesn't even matter if you're an atheist. We have an opportunity mm -hmm. now to get ahead of something and say, let's fix this before it's even more broken. That's it. If we get ahead of it, it doesn't even matter what state you're in. Uh -uh. You know, we can get ahead of this and we can say, let's fix this. We can do away with the stupidest regulations there are. Like, you know, if I'm married, I get to keep more of my own money because they don't decide how to spend it for me. Well, not really, because I won't go into you spend my money anyway. <laughs> um, is there a site we could do to, to get information about this issue? Um, not really, because as far as I know, I'm the only one talking about it right now. Now, if you want information on fair tax, there is fairtax.org. They've got one of the best videos out there on... Uh, the the, de the uh, what the value added tax is, it's about thirty minutes and it's well worth it. And I think I shared that on Facebook the other day on my personal page, so you can watch that. That's a good site to go to for taxes. But as far as this divide on um, the United Methodist Church, if you really want to know what's going on, you can go to their website. You've got to go to their news tab, um, and there's different articles down there that'll talk about it. They they tell you all about it. And like I say, it's their story to tell, but the fallout, the fallout of what has the potential to happen is um, something we can control. Mm -hmm. And it's something we need to get ahead of and need to control. If you think that uh, the banking in industry failure of 2008 was bad, wait till this mess hits the United States tax code. It could be worse. It could be worse. But if we can get ahead of it and we can put some, some intelligence in this, then what we can do is restructure not only the tax code but the marriage laws and everything else that's associated with it. And we can actually take the government out of our churches. Wouldn't that be a nice thing to do? That's actually what I'm advocating here is getting the government out of our churches. You know, making sure that the people have the information that they need to say, you know, Mr. Representative, Mr. Senator, let's sit down and have this conversation. What can we do about this? Um, one of the biggest arguments for gay marriage that I heard in the beginning was, well, you know, I can't have a family member. My, my partner can't come into the room and make decisions. Mm -hmm. But if we do away with marriage license and we go to that insurance. civil civil insurance it, it required, you know, it settles the legal questions. Mm -hmm. you, not only are you a beneficiary, but you're a health care decision person. Mm -hmm. They can be there. And it's not going to fall back on the other family members. Um, um, Jay asked, do we contact our representatives, state and local, uh, or federal politicians? It depends on what you want to talk to them about. If you want to talk to them about doing away with the IRS and looking at fair tax or that type thing, you need to talk to your federal representatives and federal senators. If it is about your marriage license um, and, and 
correcting that fiasco, that's your local folks. Those are the state representatives you need to talk to. You know, and I think, I'm a little optimistic here, but I really think if our state representatives knew why that marriage license was put in place, I think they'd be really be willing to do away with it. Mm-hmm. Now, the problem is the counties are probably sitting here. The pathonotary is probably sitting there. If he's listening, or she's listening, I'm not sure who it is now. They're probably going, no, 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 we need that money. Well, no, you don't. Mm-mm. If you if you don't have any paperwork to push around, you're not going to miss that twenty bucks. It's it's okay. Yeah, it's not they a big save deal. You a hundred dollars worth of pushing for a twenty. Right. Well, it's not twenty paper. bucks anymore either. It was twenty dollars well, when. Yeah, yeah. true. When you we know, got I, married. When we got married. But now, if you're <laughs> if you're out of state, it could be as high as one hundred and twenty or one hundred twenty five dollars. I think. Oh wow! Because not only do they provide the license, but they will also do the service for you. Okay. Um can't remember the guy's name. He was the county pathonotary for years. He did mar- memorable marriages. That's right. Remember? So um, that was that was locally, and, you know, he did a nice job. He really did. He was mm-hmm. a nice guy. did a nice job. He was professional about it. Um, you know, in his advertisements, he, you know, he was kind of joking about it, but he, he really was a nice guy. Did did some really good stuff. But here's, here's the thing. He shouldn't have had to. Mm-hmm. It's not a government job to marry people. It's not a government institution. It's not a civil institution. It's a church institution. Just my opinion. Not so very humble about that one either because I hate marriage licenses. hate everything they stand for. Um, So don't, don't be afraid to pick up that phone and say, let me sit down and talk to you. Let me buy you a cup of coffee. If you're, if you live in a district like, uh, one of the local districts here, he actually, I don't know if he still does it at the same place, but he, you know, once a month he would come out and you could sit down, drink a cup of coffee and, and discuss things with him. One of the very few that still do that. So it's a good thing to do. Get to know your representatives anyway. Because let's face it, folks, they are serving us. They might not see it that way all the time, mm-hmm. but we, they, they ran they for work, office. They worked for us. They worked for us. And as far as I'm concerned, they're no different than any other contractor you would hire to work for you. Mm-hmm. They need to do things your way. That's it. But I feel the same way about doctors and dentists too. They need to do things my way. You know, if, if I'm having an issue and I'm not feeling good and I go to a doctor. Fix it. It's fix it. <laughs> what do you need to do to fix it? And that's basically what I'm saying about, you know, looking, talking to your representatives and senators. We have a situation. Let's fix it before it gets worse. That's it. So in other countries, um, this is going to affect other countries as well. Mm-hmm. The Methodist Church is, uh, Jay says, they serve, they serve us, not we serve them. That's the way it's supposed to work. Um, other countries, the Methodist churches, and, and to some extent they do it in this country too, um, they will put a group together and they will go to a different part of the country or a different country altogether and they will provide services for people. And they call that their mission work, right? Mm-hmm. The United States has gotten terrible about this because what they would do is they would take a group from like Baltimore they would go down to somewhere in a poor part of the Appalachian Mountains and they would paint somebody's house or fix somebody's step and they call this mission work. That's not mission work in my opinion. That's free labor. Mm-hmm. You know, sorry guys. I mean, granted, some people probably need that, but... Oh, they needed it, but that should have been taken care of by the local church. Exactly. Okay? You know, I there, we've heard horror stories not too far from here. Mm. Where the church actually called the the, the county uh, in code enforcement on their next door neighbor for letting, her, for letting their grass grow. You know, nobody from the church went and knocked on the door and said, are you feeling okay? Nobody from the church mm-hmm. went and knocked on their door and said, you know, can our youth group mow your grass for you? Mm-hmm. Now, it happened to be an older person who had been injured. The they were in the hospital. Uh-huh. 
Um, they rehab. came out of the hospital. They were in rehab. They couldn't mow their grass. Mm -hmm. But instead of somebody going and knocking on their door, they went to the county enforcement officer and to for, get them to yeah. do that. Just, That's just, is that the kind of a church you want to promote? Is that the kind of a church you want to attend? Is that the kind of a church you want to be associated with? I didn't really want to get off on that tangent. But no, there, but, but you did. Um, and sometimes that needs to happen. Sometimes that needs to happen <laughs> because it, it needs to be brought out. Because all of that comes together. All of this conversation comes together. But if we get out ahead of it and we, and we actually lead, you know, we can turn some things around and for the better this time. Mm -hmm. We can actually do things act really for um, the benefit of the people. Because, let's face it, we either do it for... <laughs> we either... Do... Jay's commenting on real Go church politics. <laughs> <laughs> we, either, we either help them guide us in a beneficial way that benefits us or they will guide themselves in a way that benefits them. Mm -hmm. Which way do you think they're going to go if we leave them alone? <laughs> they're going to benefit themselves. They're going to benefit themselves. Um, folks, really, all joking aside, if you, if you don't think that this can, can affect you, think again, because it has the potential to affect you. Uh, I was talking to a very lovely young lady the other day who is a member of the, the Methodist Church, and uh, she says, well, other churches have split and nothing's happened. Hmm. Well, other churches have split, but they have not been as large, as wealthy, or had the sheer numbers that this one does. Mm -hmm. um, and don't forget, there are tax laws, regulations, and policies that are foundational to the way modern Christian church operates. And when that gets shaken up, gives them the perfect opportunity to readjust. And I'm talking That's about it. I'm talking about the tax man. It gives him the perfect opportunity to readjust things. And I can guarantee you, your taxes will not reduce. Mm -mm. If that if we if we leave it up to them, your taxes will not go down. They will go up. They will go up. But in the United States, we have the opportunity to at least, at least have our voice heard. Um, wish every nation had that opportunity. Mm -hmm. I really do. But if you, I can, I can guarantee you, it's, I've seen it time after time after time, if people are allowed to keep more of their own money, they give more of their own money away. But if the government takes it and, just, and tries to decide who to give it to, people get stingy and they will find ways to mm -hmm. hide their money. That's it. It's that simple. Can't help it. Mm -hmm. Human nature is part of it. But then greed is part of it as well. So. Mm -hmm. Um. I really wish I didn't have to, to talk about this tonight, but it gives us the opportunity to have a conversation you know, about what we can do as believers in a biblical way. Mm -hmm. And what better biblical way is there than to go out, and you know what, if you wind up making a disciple out of a representative, hey, so go for it. it. <laughs> you know, but they need to see this side of people. They need to see this side of church members, not somebody who is in their face against something that's already been going on, but somebody who's saying, let me help you lead this conversation. So go out there and do it. Go out there and do it. I can't do it by myself. Because if I, if I just do it by myself, it's some nut going out there saying, he wants to do what? <laughs> but if y'all go out there with me, then it's a bunch of nuts going out there, and they got to listen to us. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> if we're, you know, if we're all crazy together, it's not crazy, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I had to say that, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. We certainly thank you for joining us today. You know, whenever or whenever you happen to listen to this, because a lot of people are going to listen to it later. Mm -hmm. So don't forget, um, hit those like buttons, hit those share buttons, spread this around. Because we have got to get out and get in front of this stuff. So, yes, we do. As, as much as I'd like to sit here and keep talking, I'm going to not do that tonight because we have other things to do too. So, we certainly thank each and every one of you for joining us. Have a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful week. Be blessed.